But, you know, my thing is, if you love something so much, know the history of it. If you love hip-hop that much, know where it started at and know the culture. If you love art, you know, when I went to school, I learned about Ansel Adams, you know, very famous photographer, other famous photographers. Know the history of whatever you love to do. Um, when did you realize that you wanted like to do this, like photography was your thing? Well, I got introduced to photography in school, okay? Uh, back then the school system had a lot of money in, into arts programs and, you know, things of that nature. And I just picked it up in school. And as I got older, I became the, you know, junior high school yearbook photographer and then the high school year, yearbook photographer. And I just walked around with a camera everywhere I went. I was athletic, but not athletic enough to, to go on to the, you know, the high school teams. I was into music, but I wasn't, as, you know, I wasn't a good DJ or MC when it came to the hip hop. But I was a good photographer, okay, and popular. And then, you know, you develop your own pictures. My mother gave me one. Of, we had two bathrooms in our apartment, so I got to use one of the bathrooms as a dark room. And you know, I take your picture today, and tomorrow you come by the house, and I have your picture. You know, you know, I'll let you in a little secret. You know, I had ulterior motives. You know, girls love having their pictures taken, yeah. so that's why I took, you know, I was a chubby little kid with a big afro, so the camera was the, you know, the icebreaker, so to speak. But I love photography. I love photography and just continued. Did a year in college for it, and um, you know, pretty much taught myself photography. How did you receive your first camera? <laughs> Actually, it was a gift. It was a gift because uh, my mother saw how involved I was in photography in school. And one Christmas, she gave me, uh, I think, a Minolta Instamatic film camera. That was one of my very first cameras. Were there any other cameras like that, or did you have that for a really long time? I mean, you got to understand something. We're talking early 70s, you know, and my mother raised five kids by herself. So the money wasn't that you know, available. So that camera stood with me for a while yeah. until I started working and saving up money and got, got myself a new camera. So, like, when you say you were a poor kid in the Bronx, how did you, like, I don't know how much in large cost, like, cost back then. How did you get your well, hands on one? I wasn't poor. You know what? But poor to you may not be poor to me or poor to me may not be poor to you. Yeah. When I mean poor, is that my mother raised five, five kids by herself. Yeah. No other income whatsoever. So like, when I outgrew my clothes, my younger brother got them. You know, hand-me-downs. But when you work hard enough or you do well enough in school, one thing my mother always supported, all of us, is that as long as you did well in school, or did well in everything, she will go that extra mile to get whatever you want. And in a larger back then, might have been 60, 70 bucks. You know, I'm not talking a fancy. You know, in a larger, it's just a light and a negative holder where the light just shines down on paper. Yeah. It's really nothing fancy mechanically. So it wasn't really that expensive. You know, 60, 70 bucks, of course, is a lot of money back then. But, you know, I worked hard. You know, my mother worked hard. You know, and you get things like that for doing well. So you talking about your um your brothers and sisters? Did they ever think your photography was lame or you know just of really weird? Of course they did. Of course they did. You know, I was the oldest out of five brothers and sisters, and you know, my thing was photography. You know, my other brothers were into sports. My sisters were doing what they were doing, and it's like yeah, they thought it was lame. But they look at it today and it's like wow, <laughs> Joe's been all over the world with his lame <laughs> photography and everything like that. How you feel about that? It's, it's a good feeling. I never th in my wildest dreams thought that I'd be traveling the world showing pictures that I took at such a you know, young age, your age. You know, who would have ever thought a kid from the South Bronx has been to Japan, Korea, London, Amsterdam, going to Germany in September, just on photographs that I took. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So when you talk about being the, um, your school photographer, did you have any like 
since you were taking pictures a lot, did you have any periods where you didn't feel like taking pictures? I mean, I guess that's true in anything anybody does. You know, you got the you know, your, your peaks and valleys, your highs and lows, where you just don't want to take pictures. You know, yeah, there was times I didn't want to go take pictures in, in, in school. But, you know, I had a responsibility because, you know, I was the school photographer. So if there was an event going on, I had to go cover it, you know, a basketball team, game, baseball, softball, you know, covered it. Were there any um, complications between the people, like, you took <clears throat> pictures of, like, say, any of the basketball team members or baseball team members didn't want to take their picture or anything? No, it, things were different back then. Everybody wanted to have their picture taken. You know, it's not like today where... You have the internet and everything of that nature, and everybody's walking around with a cell phone camera. You know, they don't want their pictures shown because it might end up somewhere, this, that, and the other. Everybody wanted their picture taken back then, and especially in school because you know, if I was taking your picture, it was going to end up in the school newspaper or the school this or the school that. So it was pretty cool back then. So you're like a little celebrity. Pretty much, I guess. No, I guess. I guess you can say that. Pretty much. Where's Joe? I want my picture taken so it could be come out next month in the newspaper or something like that. Yeah. So what really got you like headed towards the scene of hip hop? Like, what actually got you into that specific type of photography that you wanted to capture that? I was fortunate enough to have gone to school with some of the pioneers of hip hop. Um, Tony Tone and Easy AD from the Cold Crush Brothers were schoolmates of mine. Okay. They were also basketball players on the team, and I was invited one day to go to this hip-hop jam. You know, hip-hop, I don't even think it was called hip-hop back then, you know, that came later on. And at that time, I was into disco. Everybody's heard of disco around here. So I went to this, to this hip-hop jam up in the Bronx at this place called the Tea Connection, very famous place, and saw a bunch of guys with mics and a DJ playing these big break beats. And what I tell people is that I was kidnapped into hip hop and never left. So that was, you know, you know, my introduction to hip hop. And from then, you know, the guys, you know, put together a group called the Cold Crush Brothers, who are some of the, the founding fathers of hip hop. And I got to travel with them. I became like their, their official photographer. And um, through them, I met Curtis Blow, Africa Bambada you know, Cool Herc, all of these celebrity pioneers today. And you said that hip-hop kidnapped you. What made you never want to leave hip-hop? <laughs> wow. The music grabbed me and kidnapped me, and then later on as the culture developed, the way people dressed, the way the people acted amongst themselves, you know, the break dance and the b-boys and, and the graffiti, it just... It's just something that I live today. You know, I'm a 47-year-old kid today, walking around with Nike high tops. Okay, <laughs> you know, and it's just the way I live today. You know, hip hop to me is a culture. It's, it's a way of living. Okay, it's the way you dress, the way you treat people, the way you you know perceive things in the world. You know, it's not only just music. It's not only just graffiti. It's not only just emceeing or DJing. It's a whole combination of things. Well, in the New York Times, they quoted you as the man who took hip hop's baby That's pictures. Right. How does that really like? Like, how does that really like hit? Does that really hit you? Like, when people say something like that? It does. It does. I, you know, I'm not into titles or anything like that. But when 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 people recognize me as making a contribution to something that I love so much, and my contribution to the culture of hip hop was documenting some of the most earlier scenes of hip hop, it makes me feel good. You know, it does. You know, when people do documentaries and research on this, you know, you got to understand something. Hip-hop back then was just a bunch of kids, kids in the South Bronx, black, Latino, white, Asian, whatever, just making a statement or doing something they wanted to do. 30 years later, 35 years later, it's a billion, you hear me? Billion dollar industry. And... You know, when people want to do research or document, you know, films or whatever, and they want to see the, the, the early days, they look at my work. And that's my contribution. And, and it's a good feeling. It really is. Because never in my wildest dreams did I expect it to be this way. Um, what were some of the obstacles you had to overcome while coming up in the industry? 
Well, I was never really part of the industry. You know, oh. the industry, and, and it's okay, it's okay. Um, the industry didn't come till later on. You know, again, you know, we were a bunch of 16, 17 year olds just having a good time. You know, we were working towards that next Friday, that next Saturday. You know, how many girls we can get to come to the next party or, or, or whatever. Or what kind of music, you know, what kind of new music we were going to find. Um, and my role was just, you know, taking pictures. Because at the jams, you know, if, if I took pictures one Friday night, next Friday night, you know, I had the pictures blown up. 8 by 10 and we would throw them out to the crowd. So that, that's what made us different from other hip hop groups back then. Um, some of the obstacles, you know, it was, a, even though it was an, an, an innocent time, a fun time, you know, it still had, you know, things to deal with like the drugs and, and the violence and stuff, not as prevalent as today, but you know, they were around. And if you guys did, you know, do a little research on me, you know, I had my problems with drugs and I had to put my camera down for a few years and deal with that. But, you know, those were some of the obstacles. And, you know, the obstacles as a teenager, period, growing up, you know, it wasn't all about having fun. You had to stay in school, do your thing, you know, hopefully get a, you know, part-time job because cameras didn't fall off the back of the trucks back then as they do today and things of that nature. But, you know, so you had to work towards those things. You know, if you wanted to buy records for the next jam, you had to work. So, you know, those are the, some of the typical obstacles. And you said also that you just threw the pictures away like that. Didn't that we gave them out. And that was one of the fun things about the jams we did back then. The Cold Crush Brothers were very clair clairvoyant. You know, they saw the, f the future of the music and stuff. So during their shows, you know, we throw out pictures of themselves. During the shows, they throw out, you know, cassettes of their music, and that's what made them so popular. I mean, I think they did two records in their career, but, you know, you, Jay-Z sings about this group. You know, uh, P. Diddy, Russell Simmons, they all sing about these guys that I grew up with. And if it wasn't for these guys, you know, the Jay-Zs and the Puff Daddies and all that wouldn't be where they're at today. So, you know, we were kind of innovated in, you know, throwing out my pictures, throwing out music, and things of that nature. So, it was fun. It was fun. And there are some of them still circulating. But, <clears throat> anybody heard the movie uh, CB4, Chris Rock? The first 30 seconds of that movie is a huge picture of mine. And that picture was, you know, was one of the pictures we had thrown out, you know. There's books out there that were using my photographs that I didn't know about, but they were using. And that was basically from the photographs that we threw out. So it was fun. When you say, like, when hip hop first started being more mainstream, do you, like, remember a time, like, when it first started, like, when all this media mm -hmm. attention, such. Hip hop became commercial, or what we call a bubblegum hip hop with Sugar Hill Gang, Rappers Delight, and that's 7980, okay? Yeah. Hip hop has a whole life before that. People think that, you know, Rapper's Delight was the first hip hop record, and that's when hip hop started. Hip hop had been alive 10 years, at least 10 years earlier than that, okay? Um, with the Sugar Hill Gang's record, you know, that was three guys that were put together that had no street cred or anything like that. You know, one guy worked in a pizzeria, the other, you know, and they were just marketed as a group. And that was, that's when hip hop became commercialized. It was heard on the radios and, and things of that nature. So that's when it went almost mainstream. It wasn't too mainstream yet. To me, it went mainstream like two years later with Run DMC, that group. Mm -hmm. But you know, things changed. You know, now it wasn't about the party scene and having a good time and working to next Friday, you know, the next event. It was about getting that record deal and making money. And when you involve money, your values and integrity change. What was one of your most <laughs> favorite parties that you just had to just, you just went crazy with pictures? Like, like one of your most rememberable? Back then? Yeah. Probably the first time I saw Run DMC. Probably the first time I saw Run DMC. And they weren't even the opening act back then. You know, the Cold Crush Brothers had opened up to them. 
Um, that was a great party. That was a great scene because they had their first single on, on the radio. It's like that, and that's the way it <laughs> So that was pretty cool. And then meeting Africa Bambata, who today I'm still great, great friends with. You know, those were, you know, th they were giants back then. Cool Herc and Africa Bamba, and meeting them for the first time. So, you know, those scenes, I took a lot of pictures. That was fun. Um, as we know, like, during the early 70s in the Bronx, things have been happening. Like, how does that, how did that affect you in taking things photography? Things happening like what? The Bronx like is it, burning? Like, the burning, <laughs> yeah. The, the 70s the 70s and early 80s were a troubling time in the Bronx. Well, New York City, period, but bas basically in the Bronx. It was going big th through this big transition where a lot of the landlords were burning down the, their buildings to collect insurance money, okay? Drugs were rampant, gangs were rampant, you know, and out of all of that negativity, you know, the birth of hip-hop came out of. So, you know, there's a saying in Spanish we have, no hay mal que por bien no venga. Anybody know what that means? There isn't any bad that happens that good does not come out of it. So I guess with all of that bad stuff that was happening, <clears throat> the good thing was, you know, hip hop. And not only hip hop, Latin music was, you know, at its peak back then too. Hector Lavoe, Sergio Cruz, you know, all of that stuff. Community, you know, togetherness, uproar was real you know, tight back then. You had a lot of school, dem you know, demonstrations, you know, for better education, you know, better, you know, lunch programs, you know. When you say that they had, like, more money for, like, <clears throat> lunch programs and for better lunches, was, were those type of things, like, better than they are now? Um, yes. Yes. America wasn't as broke as it is today back then. So there was a lot of money for, you know, school programs and, you know, music programs, athletics and, and, and that nature. Um, I've been out of touch, obviously, because I've been out of school for a long time. But, you know, I read the newspaper how, you know, they're closing music programs down in school and closing schools, period, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, times were different. Times were really different. What you were saying about, or how Betsy was saying, how the Bronx was changing and like the bad, like helped turn good things. Um, how you were saying with drugs came out and like gangs. How how did you get involved with that? Like what? Like how did you get well, involved with that? I didn't I didn't get involved with the gang, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I did fall prey, so to speak, to to the drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, drugs for me at that time were just recreational things of that nature of you know who I was hanging out with especially a lot of the, the musicians that I was hanging out with and for me and this is just my own you know personal story you know I turned the first time I experienced death in my family the first time somebody really close died to me my grandmother who, who wrote those famous words there when she died I experienced a pain that I had never ever ever experienced and that was the death of somebody dying so I turned to drugs to, to hide from that pain. Mm -hmm. And one thing led to another. It became a, a habit. And you know, I lost my job, became homeless, living in the street, things of that nature. And through the grace of God, you know, I found my way out. And I've been clean 19 years, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So stay away from drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Serious. So you were doing photography, you got your recognition, and then you went into that little time, Pretty, time zone that you were doing drugs. How did you get your, like, after, after you ended that, how did you get your stuff back out there? Pretty much, I didn't have recognition back then. I mean, I was known, you know, as a teenager back then as the Cold Crush Brothers photographer or the high school photographer, and pretty much that's the only recognition I, I had back then. When the drugs came around, I sold all my camera equipment. So got rid of everything. My mother, for some reason, saved all my negatives. Everything you see here, my mother saved. And it wasn't, and I put the camera down and I dealt with the drugs. And then I got clean, you know, I joined the army, 
became a nurse in the Army, you know, and was, was on a straight path. And it wasn't until 9-11. You guys know I work for the fire department, right? Yeah. Besides taking pictures, I save lives and I deliver babies for a living. <laughs> Serious. I've been with the fire department 18 years, okay? It wasn't until 9-11, my ambulance was one of the first ambulances downtown during 9-11, and I got buried alive, literally, buried alive. And I had to do two years of therapy behind that. Physically, I wasn't hurt, but I was just tripping out on why was I still alive and 3,000 other people dead. Because literally, if you ran that way, you lived. If you ran this way, you died. So it was during my therapy sessions that came out that it wasn't my time to go, that I still had a lot to share with the world. And my mother goes, listen, I got this box here that belongs to you. And it was all my negatives, literally thousands and thousands of negatives. And one day at a park jam, this Henry Chalfont, who did a few movies, Flying Cut Sleeves and Star Wars, said, Joe, did you do this picture? I saw it on Charlie Chase's mantle. I go, yeah, I got it. He goes, I'd like to buy it. I'd like to license it for my new film. And from, it was, from that point on, VH1 started calling me, MTV, everybody and their mother. And that's when I started just taking out my negatives and scanning them and printing them up. And, and this all, that all started maybe about seven, eight years ago. So that's when I got the recognition. I had already been clean, off of drugs, a good, you know, 10, 12 years. Exactly how did you, like, for, for the shot, I, like, each shot for, like, the, like, the Cold Crush Brothers, they're all set up differently. Like, how did you set up for each shot? You're going to understand something. Um, when you take somebody's picture, you're invading their space, pretty much. Pretty much you're invading their space, okay? Paparazzis today, you know, you know what a paparazzi is? They invade people's space, and that's, they give us photographers such a bad name. So, you know, I wasn't going to take your picture back then if you didn't want me to take your picture. And that's, today I still do that. If you don't want me to take your picture, fine, I won't. But what I tell them is, you won't be in my next book then, you know. But, you know, you, you have to respect somebody when you take their picture, okay? My other shots, you know, whether they're formal, where, where the guys are standing around, those are pretty much staged and pretty much, you know, capturing the moment and stuff. Um, photography has to do with composition, your eye. What do, you, what do you see? If you see something that catches your eye, you want to take that same scene and put it on film or, you know, capture it digitally, you know, today's. And so that's what, you know, it, that's what we call composition, okay? You know, you look at a lot of pictures, you know, everybody's in the center of a picture. You don't have to do that. You can have them off center and also have, you know, whatever the background is. It's all developing your eye. It doesn't always have to be straightforward or anything like that. So, you know, and that's, you know, I developed that early as a kid at, at a young age. You know, just different, you know, scenes. You want to tell a story. You want to tell a story. What's the saying about a photograph? Or a thousand words. A thousand words. And it captures a moment. And what I've been told what I've been told about my photographs is that it, it brings, it transports you back to that time. You know, my photographs have been described as a fly on the wall, just, you know, capturing the scene. So, but you, you always have to respect somebody's space when taking their picture. I wanted to ask you, like, as to, like, the aesthetic quality to your photographs. Like, um, why black and white? Okay, well, black and white back then was the only thing I could afford, okay? Being a teenager in the Bronx, you know, working, you know, part-time after school, only getting $40, you know, every two weeks, $60 every two weeks, it's the only thing you can afford. Plus, black and white to me is, is more colorful. Think about it. Black and white is more colorful. And to this day, I still love black and white. You know, I can shoot digital pictures, color, 
but convert them into black and white. And I do that a lot, okay? Um, black and white was easier for me to develop in my bathroom back then. You know, you have three chemicals and they're larger and voila, you got a picture. You know, with color, it's a bunch of other chemicals and it's harder. But to me, black and white is just more natural and more colorful. Was photography like more of an art form too, or is it for like documentation? Today? Today is more, well, back then it was more of an art form for me because I was just learning the ins and out, you know, learning it and, you know, how to do different procedures in the darkroom and, you know, polarization, solarization, you know, making crazy things in there, you know. But today it's about documenting. It's about documenting. Um, we all should document our culture, whatever it may be. We should not let an outsider come and document something that we do. We should document our own culture. We should write about our own culture. You know what I mean? So today, you know, I, that's how I shoot today. I still shoot, you know. <clears throat> and I just love taking pictures. I love taking pictures. I love experimenting. I love different lighting, different this, different that. You know, it's just amazing. And just to know that 30 years from now, what I shoot today is going to be, you know, archival also, which is cool. So um, you said that you still shoot and stuff. What do you like to take pictures of now? I shoot a lot of concerts. A lot of I still shoot the hip hop scene. Okay, I'm the official photographer at Lehman College for all the concerts there. You know, today I'm shooting people like Chaka Khan and. You know, B.B. King and The Temptations and, you know, all those people, you know, that I would never have gotten a chance to shoot. So I shoot those. Uh, I'm the Bronx Borough President's official photographer, so when he does his events, I'm, they call me. And it's cool. Nice. Yeah, it is nice. So how do you feel from where you used to be from to, to where you are now? And then you also said that you just got your recognition a couple years ago for photography, and how far do you look to go with it? Um, I tell people I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I should have been dead, not once, but twice, okay? But I'm still here, okay? I tell people I'm blessed that, you know, I still, you know, pinch myself when I get invited to, you know, these countries, I mean, Japan, that place is awesome. Korea, awesome. London, Amsterdam. Just last week, I got invited to Germany. I'm going there in, in, in September. So, you know, I'm blessed. I really am. Where do, I don't think I can go much further in terms of my photography. I think I can continue doing what I'm doing today. I'm still waiting for that phone call from like a P. Diddy or Jay Z saying, "Joe, I want you to shoot my album cover or something like that." And you know, here's a check for fifty thousand dollars <laughs> and stuff. Do I think it's gonna happen? Probably not. But you know what? What I do today is not about money. This to me is priceless. This is priceless. You can't put that. You can't put a dollar figure on that. When I go to schools and, and, and speak, priceless. If I can share my story with you guys in terms of my photography, the way I was raised, you know, my mistakes or my demons, cool, cool. So if I can continue doing that, I'll be one happy camper. Um, right now in your like in your life, is there any anybody who you feel like who you feel like has had like the most huge besides the camera? that has had the most huge impact on your life, and you would thank them? Jamel Shabazz. These are photographers that I look up to. Jamel Shabazz, Ernie Panicoli, um, Martha Cooper, Henry Chalfant. These are photographers that I looked up to growing up, okay? And now I am the best of friends with them. And that, to me, is just awesome, meeting people that you have looked up to. You know, they've had, they've been photographing this culture of hip hop just as long as I have. You know, um, I have been taking pictures a little bit long, longer than they have, but they made a career out of it, okay? I had, like I said, I had to put my camera down and 
deal with issues and then you know my career went off into the medical field and so looking at you know these mentors these people that I looked up to and their books and all of that and then finally getting to meet them and them accepting me as one of their own is is amazing so they've had a huge impact and you guys know who Jamal Shabazz is right and Ernie Panacoli and Africa Bambada and all that Again, you know, who would ever thought a kid from the South Bronx traveling the world? If you guys notice, my high school yearbook is over there. And in my high school page, my graduation page, you know, it's my aspiration is to become a successful photographer and travel the world. And 30 years later, it came true. Awesome, huh? <laughs> You guys heard a chicken noodle soup song, right? <laughs> Who did it? Yeah. Who did it? DJ Webstar and what? And Young Young B. That was such a popular song. I had taken pictures of them when they first started, okay? Singing in the parks and this, that, and the other. When they signed their million dollar record deal for that song, I had the pictures. <laughs> I didn't get a million dollars, but I got some money because I had pictures of them when they first started out. So, you know, always walk around with a camera. Um, did you ever name your camera? Did I ever name my camera? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think one of my cameras was named Betsy or something like that. <laughs> <laughs>